Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing Deep Work by Cal Newport, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. Earlier this year, we did Cal's first book or first uh, book of this type, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And this is Deep Work. Again, a sort of work focused, how to be better and more productive, I guess, in, in the world and in work. So, professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that push your cognitive capacities to the limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill, and are hard to replicate. That's deep work. That's deep work. Getting down and deep without distraction where your brain is fully wrapped around the one task. And that's what this book is all about. It's getting into those states. He says that deep work is necessary to wring out every last drop of value from your current intellectual capacity. And so, in order to get the most out of what you can currently do, you need to get deep and get into deep work. And as we go through this book, the first part of the book is about the, the overview, I guess, of the, the academic or philosophical look at what deep work is and why we should use it. And then the second part is the actionable tactical stuff. It's very necessary, this idea of deep work, if you really want to get good at anything, right? If you're doing only shallow things in the world, there's no way of actually you becoming a master a study by McKinsey found that the average knowledge worker today spends more than 60% of the week engaged in electronic communication and internet searching, and 30% of this time is to do with reading and answering emails. That's not deep. That's not deep. So if we contrast this deep work to shallow work, so shallow work by definition he gives here is non-cognitively demanding logistical style tasks often performed whilst distracted. These efforts tend not to create new value in the world and are easy to replicate. Now, in everyday work, there's going to be things that are shallow work. They're mostly unavoidable. They're things you have to do. But you need to really realize that whilst shallow work is important and has to be done, you can't just do shallow work all day or you're not valuable at all. You need to get deep in order to create something new and something valuable. Spending enough time in this state of frenetic shallowness, you know, which is a lot of people spend their whole day in just you know checking social media and their emails and so forth this permanently reduces your capacity Mm. to perform deep work yeah and as we said at the start deep work is the key to actually getting uh, acquiring any kind of skills to become masterful at anything that's the issue the the first issue is that obviously if you're doing shallow work you're not creating value but the the bigger issue is that if you're constantly doing shallow work you lose your ability to do deep work because you're always distracted because you're always doing what's what seems urgent. You're always answering that one email or you're always checking for the latest social media post. You're losing the ability to actually turn off those distractions and go deep. So that's a much bigger issue. The silver lining in all of this is that as our whole work culture is shifting toward this uh, this really shallow work, just looking at the emails all the time and uh, this, ho- this frenetic um, place of, of shallowness, those who actually go down the other path and really explore deep work, go really deep in all the tasks they do, they're going to have disproportionate uh, value in, in the marketplace. Yeah. In So Good They Can't Ignore You, he talks about rare and valuable skills. And that's the type of person who wins in the end of the day is having rare and valuable skills. And one of the rarest and most valuable skills is this ability to do deep work. It's almost like a, a meta skill. You need to be able to do deep work in order to build other rare and valuable skills. He actually goes as far as saying that deep work is the superpower of the 21st century. So as we're all doing knowledge work more and more, deep work is the is the key to success. So to sum it up, this whole deep work hypothesis is the ability to perform deep work is becoming increasingly rare at the exact same time it is becoming valuable. Mm-hmm. So as a consequence, those who cultivate this skill of going deep and make it the core of their whole working life are going to thrive and kick some kick some ass. That's a real double banger there. Like if it's getting more and more rare, at the same time it's getting more and more valuable. It's just like bang, bang, bang. So that's what you want. So the next three parts of this of this part one, he says that deep work is valuable, deep work is rare, and deep work is meaningful. So he deep, dives a bit deeper into each of these three deep principles. So the first one, deep work is valuable. And so he says that in this new economy, there's going to be three types of people who really thrive. One is the high skill worker, and the high skill worker is uh, someone with this ability to work with increasingly complex world, like it, work within a complex world with complex machines. So it's the high skill worker is the one that can assimilate most with you know AI and things that are coming and become highly skilled and hence valuable. The other type of person who's going to be increasingly valuable in our economy is the superstars. So say if you're a graphic designer or something like, something like that, and you're pretty good. 
you're not going to really cut it anymore because everyone, even in your geographic location now, has access to the very best mm. on the other side of the world. So those who are the absolute very best are going to absolutely clean up. And if those who are very good, they're probably going to lose out a little bit more. Definitely. Uh, that's very pretty prevalent in like the dip and tribes by Seth Godin, like this uh, principle of Zipf's law where the the tenth per, the the best person gets 10 times the reward of the 10th best person. It's it's so valuable to be the best. So that's why superstars are going to be right at the top of the pile and get even more valuable in the future. And if you look at things like Google as well, right? Like Google search mm. algorithms, you just click the first one. Before yeah. Google, you'd go to maybe the, in Australia, it's the yellow pages and it'd kind of be spread out who you'd, who you'd go to now. But now it's disproportionately just going to the top. Definitely. And the third type of person that's going to thrive is the the owners. So if you can own like either the capital or you can or the technology, you're going to thrive in this, you know, this new world that's coming. So these three people, right? These these three types of people, if you want to become one of those who are going to be extremely valuable, it comes down to two different things. Number 1 is you need to have the ability to master hard things, and number 2, you need the ability to produce at a really elite level in terms of quality and speed. There's a question here, mate, is how do you get both of those things, you know, mastering hard things and producing at an elite level? Deep work. Deep work, mate. I don't think it's um, just, <laughs> just floating around on Instagram and, no, and Facebook it. all day. <laughs> or like you, mate, during uh, during trade week. <laughs> yeah, AFL trade week just wrapped up, thankfully, because I was going very shallow during trade week. Uh, but that's a, so that's what we're saying here is that deep work is valuable. Thanks to all these reasons that are coming, deep work is becoming more and more valuable. And I like this equation he puts in here. Uh, it's probably not exact, an exact equation, but high quality work equals time spent multiplied by intensity of, of focus. So most people might just look at the time spent. High quality work equals time spent. But you really got to factor in that intensity of focus. So obviously, if you're doing work, but you're also then a new email pops up and you reply to it, I'll just quickly reply to this email. Or you see an AFL trade go down, so you just check the details of that trade. Your intensity of focus factor there is is much lower than if you were full deep. So you've got to really factor in that intensity of focus into the equation, not just time spent. Well done, mate. You've come around a bit. I remember um, saying this to you when you were during trade week. You're like, no, nah, this is valuable oh, stuff. Oh, no, no, I still maintain that it was valuable. Yeah, it wasn't valuable going <laughs> to trade week. But there's actually research to show this, right, by this lady called Sophie Loroy, who was a business professor who wrote the paper, Why Is It So Hard to Do My Work? And the research was into how we move from task to task and what the costs, the cognitive costs of doing all this switching actually has on our work. So as you were saying then, you know, you're doing something important and then an email pops up and you just go, oh, shit, I'll just, I'll just quickly email this. On the surface, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but she says or she shows that it, it is a much bigger deal than you think. And it's a thing that she terms attention residue. So you might think, okay, I'm doing task A, I'll quickly switch out to task B and quickly switch back and it's going to take me one minute and I'll get back into it. But it's not just that one minute. There's also that attention residue where whilst you're trying to get back into task A, you're still thinking about task B. So the impact on your task A goes well beyond just that one minute it took to quickly switch tasks and switch back. Your attention has this new target, you know, just going back and forth, right? So if you have your attention solely on the one thing, you have the ability to go deeper and deeper. And if we go back to the equation you mentioned earlier, high quality work equals time spent multiplied by intensity of focus. Now that part of your focus, it goes all the way up because your target is just on the one thing and the intensity of focus increases, so the quality of your work also increases. Yeah, and again, she um, in this paper here, she reiterated the fact that we mentioned earlier that it's not just this once-off thing, it's also then becomes the thing that you do. So it's not just in this one instance you were less focused, it becomes you're always then going to be more easily distracted by any new thing that pops up. So you've got to realize that it's a, a long-term permeating effect, this task switching, and you lose the ability to focus deeply for long periods of time. And that's it. Deep work is valuable. Another big thing Cal mentions here is that deep work is rare. And if you look at the big trends that are happening around the world in, you know, in, in companies and big corporate, there are things like open plan offices where they're trying to really increase serendipity, which you know, mm. they might have some value in that of itself. But the cost of having open plan offices where uh, everyone's just tapping on your shoulder, asking questions or whatever... Same thing, right? Your intensity of focus really gets uh, knocked out of the park. Yeah, you might think that oh, if people just run into each other and they can share ideas or if they've got a problem, they can just really quickly ask somebody else to help them on the problem so they don't get stuck and waste time. 
that's what makes sense. But there is this whole deep work element that's getting destroyed in the process. And other things like instant messaging in offices, like everyone's got these big slack conversations where you're just peppering everyone and everyone's attention. Mm. And the other one is the push for employees to maintain a social media presence. So big corporate is actually um, going against deep work at the moment. So the whole world is going in this direction and not many people are going deep. Yeah, they think that the, the biggest thing here is that using busyness as a proxy for productivity. And they, they think that, okay, if we're doing lots of stuff, it means we're creating lots of value, but it's really not that at all. So these things of open planned offices, getting lots done, instant messaging, you know, quickly getting out of people's way and helping them out. It's really just busyness, not actual productivity. So people are using this busyness as a, as a proxy for productivity, right? So in the absence of clear indicators of what it means to be productive and valuable in their jobs, many knowledge workers turn back towards an industrial indi- indicator of productivity. And that's doing lots of stuff in a visible manner. Mm. And if you think of a mechanic or something like that or a carpenter or a plumber, it's really easy to, sh- to show their work is uh, directly translating into some, something productive. But for the knowledge worker, um, you could just go around all day doing, as he says, visible things in doing lots of stuff in a visible manner. And you might think you're productive, but you're not. You're doing jack shit yes. just because there's no, um, there's not, nothing physical or tangible to show that you're actually being productive. That's the thing. He says that industrial indicator, like if you're working on the, on the production line, you can say I made 100 widgets today and it's very clear as to what you did. But in the knowledge realm, it's not really quantity that means anything and the, the amount of stuff that you do in a visible manner. It's the, the quality of this productivity and that's where you need your deep work to get deep and really add something new and valuable, not just doing lots of busy, visible things just to show people how productive you are. And all of this, this spells out very bad news for business around the world in general. But for you listening, if you take action and go deep, then really good news lurks for you. That's it. So it's valuable, it's rare and the third thing he says is deep work is meaningful and we all want meaning in our work and he says that deep work is something that give, can, can give us this sense of meaning. And he touches on some of the research done by, I'm going to butcher his name here. Mihai Cheek Sent Mihai. Is that it? Yeah. I, well, didn't, even want, I didn't even want you to Cheek, Cheek Sent Mihai. That that's, yeah. that's, that's how you remember it, isn't it? There's about, uh, there's about 20 letters in that surname, so I didn't even want to give you a chance, mate. So Big Mahal says, the best moments usually occur when a person or body is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So you're doing something that's just a little bit above your ability. Um, it's not too easy, not too hard. You get in this state of flow where all these beautiful chemicals start pumping in your brain. To get deep feels really good. And he talks about that in work as well, that you know, deep work, should, if it generates this flow state and you can feel yourself you know, adding value in this flow state of deep work and you, you're adding value, being productive, not just busy, it feels bloody good and hence meaningful. So that's really selling us on deep work in general. So it's valuable, it's rare, and it's meaningful. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to argue against those three points. So I'm pretty sold on it. Are you? I'm sold, man. Deep work, it makes a hell of a lot of sense that as the world becomes more and more and more shallow and more and more and more distractions, there's so much value in being able to go deep and produce something of high value in like this state of, of deep work. So I 100% agree. And in the book, he doesn't explicitly state it like this, but you know, it's, it's common knowledge that over our careers, we're going to change a lot. So you need to keep learning mm. new and new skills. And to learn new skills, you really need to actually be able to go into deep work. Yeah. To maintain relevant. Well, like deep work in itself is an important skill, but it's also a bit of a meta skill that you need to be able to go deep in order to build other rare and valuable skills. So that was part one of the book was really selling us on this idea of deep versus shallow. Obviously, you need shallow, but so many people are losing the ability to go deep. Now, part two of the book is a bit more actionable as to how you can build some deep work into your life. He talks about actually forming a habit. And every day we have a finite amount of willpower so at first, when you really try and go deep, you're going to have to direct a lot of your willpower to going deep. But after some time, you won't be using your willpower. So it's really saying you need to form a habit around deep work. You know, structure your three to four hours a day uh, around deep work. And then over time, it's not going to take willpower. Yeah, if you have some kind of routine or ritual built in, and once it becomes a habit, it takes a long time to sort of get that habit going, a lot of effort and a lot of willpower. But once you keep that rolling, that's when it um, becomes easier and it becomes routine. You don't have to use so much willpower after that. Yeah, you might put on the, the do not disturb sign every night 
or every day or morning or something between you know for a certain two hours let everyone know this is this is my deep time baby no one's going to distract me now yeah he told a story about um jerry seinfeld it's not in our notes but i'll just go on a roll i think i remember it he talks about how a, an amateur comedian saw jerry seinfeld at a comedy club and he went up and said to him jerry how do you you know obviously how do you become jerry seinfeld and jerry said the important thing is to write every day and whilst it's hard at first he says if you get a big calendar and you put a big red x on the day that you write so you write the first and you put a big red x on the second you put a big red x on the third you put a big red x he said it's it's pretty bloody hard at first but once you get up a stretch of seven or ten or fifteen red x's you don't want to break that streak so if you can build this routine this ritual around every day and once you can see that okay i've got a big streak of 15 red x's it almost becomes easier to continue that streak rather than to get it started from zero yeah love that stuff man so yeah form a habit another thing you need to do to be able to go deep is you need to be lazy yeah i like the sound of that <laughs> that sounds bloody good if it works yeah so, idleness is not just a vacation and indulgence or or a vice it is really indispensable to the brain so he's comparing it to like vitamin like vitamin d to the body and deprived of it we really suffer uh, a mental affliction as disfiguring as rickets and <laughs> What's, I don't know what a ricket is. I don't know, some kind of disease, I guess, but yeah. But if you think about, you know, people who go home and they're constantly checking the email, checking mm. the email, checking Instagram, Instagram, uh, it's very hard these days to actually be lazy. Every time, every moment you got by yourself, there's always something to do. And Cal Newport is an advocate of being lazy and actually getting bored or structuring boredom into your life. Yeah, it's it sounds paradoxical to think, Okay, so I have to do deep work, but I also have to be lazy. But he's saying the issue is today, there's so many distractions and so much, so many things that keep us constantly on the go. Like it keeps our brain constantly stimulated. We never actually switch off our brain, let it be idle, let it be lazy, let it almost recover and let it do nothing. And that's when he says that things can start happening. You know, you, you're constantly thinking it, it gives your brain that rest. It gives your brain that time to be able to do deep work rather than just always, you know, checking the, the latest Instagram post. He sells us on three different reasons on why uh, we should be idle and, a and few, lazy. And lazy. And there's a few actionable things here. Um, he doesn't say explicitly in the book, but you know, you could just turn your emails off your phone when you get home and, and not have that on your phone. Delete Instagram, delete Facebook, and so forth. But the first reason we need to get bored and idle is downtime aids insights. Yeah, sometimes it's if you've got something on your mind and you're really thinking about some complex task or something that you need to make a decision on, if you then think, okay, I'm just going to think about this for a while as you scroll through Facebook feed, it's not going to be productive. Whereas if you can switch off and let your unconscious mind sort of roll away and tackle this problem, it's going to be much better aiding insights. Some decisions out there that you have to deal with are actually better dealt with your unconscious mind, he says. And you know, if you just think about in your own life, there might be... Uh, you come up with this special insight actually when you're really bored or you're going for a walk or something like that. If you're um, constantly busy and don't have that space in your life, then some of these big insights aren't going to creep in. The second reason that laziness is good is that this downtime helps recharge the energy we need to go and work deeply. He's got an example here of a paper that studied two groups with a concentration sapping task in two different places. One was performed in nature and one was performed in some kind of concrete jungle. And what they found was that uh, in nature, they performed 20% better. So, their concentration was improved due to being within nature. Mm, I like it. He says some alternatives um, that are you know, similar to nature that you, if you're not you know, right next to a, a rainforest, rather than you know, watching TV or going on Facebook, he says it can just be calm conversation with a friend, listening to some music while making dinner or playing a game with your kids or going for a run. These things that uh, allow us to switch off and not be constantly stimulated by social media or TV or the like. The third reason is the work that evening downtime pr- replaces is usually not that important. Yeah. So, he's saying if, you, if you've got two choices, you know, so you work during the day and at, and at night we have this downtime, this idleness, this laziness. If we instead replace that with Facebook or TV, that's not important at all. And so, it's, it's doing us harm to do these things and adding zero or negative benefit in, in many cases unless it's Survivor. No. Sorry, I disagree with that <laughs> vehemently. <laughs> so the solution here, one he has is just have a shutdown ritual when you get home. If you don't get your work done, extend your work hours during the day to get it done and then when you're home, be home. Yes. 
you need to switch off. And uh, there's a thing called the Ziagarnik effect, which we talked about in the book Presuasion by Cialdini we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, that this ability to switch off and empty things, close the loops, close any open loops in your mind. And he talked about how waiters could remember everything and once he put the food on people's um, tables, he forgot what they'd ordered effectively because he'd had this open loop. Once he'd given them the food, task was complete, loop was closed. So he's saying that what you need to do with your work, rather than having things on the go at work, and then you get home and you're constantly thinking about work, you're really not doing what we said. We're not doing idleness. We're not being lazy. We're not recovering. So what you need to do is when work finishes, work finishes. Shut the laptop, close those open loops, go home and be home and rest rather than constantly checking emails when you get home. Another rule he's got here is quit social media. I'm going to do our best to sell you guys on quitting it. I haven't quit since reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought about it though. But in, we increasingly recognize that these tools fragment our time and reduce our ability to concentrate. And if we go back to that equation we we're talking about earlier, the biggest cost of you uh, producing high quality work is the decrease in the intensity of focus. Mm-hmm. And there's no bigger um, problem for your intensity of focus than social media. So in this chapter, he's trying to make you quit social media to get your intensity of focus up on the important shit. He goes, I guess, a bit of a high ground maneuver here, a bit of an academic or philosophical look at why should we choose to go onto a specific social media network? One idea is what he calls the any benefit approach. And so if there's any benefit to going on this social media, it's worth the time wasted on it. So it might be uh, all my friends are on there and I can talk to people or I can stay more connected with people or I might learn some new business tricks by somebody I follow on social media or I'll be able to keep in touch with any new events that are coming up. Any, if we can find any one single benefit, we say it's worth it to be on that social media and then waste the other 90% of the time. The alternative approach is what he calls the craftsman approach to a tool selection. And he says that instead you need to find, okay, what are the core factors that determine success and happiness for me? And does join this social media achieve those key goals and uh in almost all cases it wouldn't if you <laughs> if you realize if you if you're going to go the craftsman approach instead of the any benefit approach uh almost nothing from social media fits into that category not everyone is going out there and crushing it yeah. like big gary <laughs> v he tries to sell everyone on like social media is the next big thing in the economy cal newport style is uh social media it is a very low-skilled, low-barrier to entry kind of thing. So, therefore, it has no value in the modern economy. Mm, he says that, so, your two options. Your any benefit approach means if there is one benefit, we can ignore all of the negatives. Whereas a craftsman approach means you have to actively choose, does this, do the positives outweigh the negatives? And, uh, again, social media probably doesn't. So, we need to get out there and, as, uh, as Cal says, quit all social media, which I also haven't done and... Uh, and I don't Probably think, won't. <laughs> I don't Probably think won't. anyone else is going <laughs> to... We sold that very weekly on everyone. No, no, it makes sense, man. It makes sense. Um, yeah. It makes sense cognitively, but uh, in action, mate, I want to... Um, one thing keep, I've keep done... With one doing. thing I've done yeah. since reading this book, which uh, this book made me do, is um, I've kind of set hours during the day where I 100% do not go on social media or go on email or anything like that. So it's like two, three-hour blocks where I can actually go deep and then the rest of the day I allow myself to do the really shallow uh, Facebooky, Instagrammy kind of shit. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the biggest tips he says is like just turn off, like schedule whatever it is, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour, whatever you do, schedule a deep work session, turn off the internet so you can't be distracted by email, you can't be distracted by trade week, you can't be distracted by social media. Turn off the internet for that deep work session. The first time you do it, it's going to be so bloody hard. Mm, it but is. But if you can build that ability to go deep it's going to be much better in the long run yeah it might just be every day you just set your time up for one hour choose the thing that's the highest priority and is actually difficult to get your head around and then for that one hour you just go hard and deep and yeah. don't take a piss break or anything like that right. a hard and deep is always 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 better that's just that's you, the way you looked at me then was sick <laughs> <laughs> that was disgusting Man, i'm just talking about work you know no, you're hard and deep <laughs> jesus uh mate in conclusion <laughs> the deep life, he says, look, it's it's not for everyone. And in reality, whilst it uh, makes sense philosophically, makes sense psychologically, almost nobody's going to do this. And of course, that makes it better for the people that do, but it's very hard to achieve this state of deep work. I'm sold on it, mate. Yeah. Go deep. Weak book. 
Mate, the 10-page summary I thought was great. The 260-page book was a, a bit of fluff, but uh, the, the real essence of this book was great. Yeah, I reckon it was an incredible book. And unfortunately, you were infected by a few biases. Number one, <laughs> you were infected by the Socko effect because I tried to sell you on this book. You pushed it too hard. I pushed yeah. it too hard. And number two is the Harry Potter effect where you prefer books like Harry Potter where uh, <laughs> you, need a, you need a very nice story and pleasant and it reads well. So when you combine these two biases, mm. you get a real concoction of irrationality in, the issue in here, terms of your viewpoints on books. So the issue here it was, was a ve- it's he, a very no, good no, book. Sorry, mate. The issue here was that he had he had <laughs> like ten pages of gold, 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 and then he filled each section of gold with a, two fluffy anecdotal stories that he pulled out of thin air that made not a lot of sense. But the, mm. mate, the ten page summary of the gold was great. So a very important book if you want to have a sick career. Now, all the books that we've reviewed in the past that are also going to make you have a sick career, we've put in one email stream. So, 12 of the best books on career uh, you will get in your email box that we've actually reviewed in the past. So, if you want to get access to all of these for free, head to whatyouwillearn.com slash email. 